Welcome to the La Dolce Vita Show, a woman's guide to living a fearless and fabulous life. My name is Heather Pickin, and I am here to give you that winning formula so that you can get clear on your vision, stay true to your values, and break through those mental walls. Check out my free resources at heatherpickin.com. This podcast is brought to you by Fierce Femme Wine, a woman's wine that inspires dialogue for change. Visit fiercefemme.com. So let's get ready as we uncover the formula to your success in business, career, and fabulous life. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Doja Vita Show, where we break down the formula on what it takes to be a fearless woman in the world today. So whether you're uh, climbing the ladder in your career or going after your biggest dreams in your business, this is the place to be. And so I want to welcome my guest today, Abby Walker. And she is the CEO of Vivian Liu, where, where you can go to VivianLiu.com. I absolutely love her business because <laughs> her business is dedicated to helping women look and feel better in high heels. And as we speak right now, I'm wearing them. I, I've got some high heel boots. Uh, they're probably about four inches long. And I will have to tell you, Abby, they get painful. They get really <laughs> yes, they do. I know that pain. <laughs> and, and my mom, I, always, I, I actually created this phrase for my mom. So a couple of years ago, uh, we were walking in like, I don't know, maybe three feet of snow, very icy. And she was wearing these stiletto heels in the snow. I love it. And I said, fashion before safety. <laughs> Fashion before safety, but actually, we are making you safety or safer today um, with, with your product, and we're going to be talking about that uh, today. So, uh, welcome, welcome to the show. Love having you on as a guest. Well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here, and I absolutely love the mission of your podcast and your business. So, um, happy to be here and, and share my story for sure. Thank you so much. And for those listeners that are watching, um, my show is being sponsored by uh, Fierce Femme Wine. Um, This is the superpower wine. Knowing yourself is like a superpower. If you're watching this on video, you'll see it. And also, uh, vote fierce. Okay, woman, got to vote fierce. Got to stand in your power. Um, That is actually one of my big visions, mission, and purpose. You go to fiercefemme.com and... uh, Talk to your fierce femme girlfriends. Have a conversation about how you can change the world because I know that we can. So, you know, it's interesting. I I was looking at, um, you you know, your bio and what's really interesting about your company. And and I really want women to look at you as a fearless example. I get a lot of women that come to me that say, Heather, I want to build a business, but I've got kids. I've got a full-time job. I can't do it. And, and so let's talk about that belief first, because you created this business out of a hobby, being a, a mom, a working mom and having a full-time job. So what was running through your head, uh, you know, about this company? Actually, let's backtrack. How did yes. you even come up with this <laughs> business? Because this is, this is a solution to a problem that all women have. Yes. So it started, um, with me working in corporate America and I had two young kids. Uh, I was in the daily grind. I had my husband work full time. We had two cats and a dog. It was the typical good life. Like if you had looked at my life from the outside, this is what I say in my book. So I, I kind of, I wrote a memoir about my journey from corporate America to entrepreneurship. But in essence, I, I was dying from the good life. I had, and if you looked at the outside, I was living the typical, she had, she was climbing the corporate ladder. She had a good life. She lived a good job. You had a good job. You know, it was all these traditional good things. And I was literally slowly dying from that good life. I felt like I'd lost all passion. And so one thing that I had always, always loved was high heels. And so I started just with an hour a week, I would write, and I started a shoe blog called mama's shoes. 
And I literally posted to it for myself. I wasn't looking to monetize it. I wasn't looking to do anything with it. It had a whole whopping 36 followers. So it wasn't this big thing, but it was like a release for me. It was some sort of like, I am going to be selfish and take an hour every weekend and write about shoes. That eventually led me to um, doing market research on blog posts. And I ran across this forum where two women were talking about this insole called Insolia. And they said that this little slim discreet insole had forever changed the way they wear high, wore high heels. And I was like, what is this? So um, something inside me had just sparked and I am a fierce introvert. And so picking up the phone and having conversations is not something that I like to do, but something within me said, you need to pick up the phone and call the chairman and ask him why you've never heard of this product. And so I picked up the phone, called the chairman of the product, asked him why I had never heard of it. And his response was simple. It was, we're a bunch of MIT engineers that don't know how to market this product to women. And so just, I offered to help him market this product for a cut of incremental sales. He told me no, because they were looking to exit the business. They weren't looking to continue to market this product to women. They had kind of pivoted their business and they were now manufacturing insoles that were built into shoes, not aftermarket insoles. And, um, through a couple of conversations, he sent me samples. I'm like, I love this product. It's going to change so many women's lives. I, we need to get this out in the marketplace. And he's like, if you want to become our exclusive distributor in the United States and Canada, here's your opportunity. And I was like, what? So it was like an instantaneous yes. I had no idea what I was doing, but wow. I knew I was being handed this incredible opportunity that I could not pass up. Well, I love this. I'm going to stop you here because I want women to, because I, what I do in the show is I dissect the formula so that women can also see what they're going through in their business and life and really great, get those golden nuggets of information. So here you are in all of your chaos, not feeling yes. happy and you are being true to yourself. You are following your formula with shoes. I mean, how yes. cool is that? You're just following that path that led you down another path to connect to this business. So it, so I always say it's like chaos can actually be a beautiful thing if you like go down the, the breadcrumb trail yes. and, and explore it. And that's exactly what you did. Oh my gosh, this is, this is so awesome. <laughs> so, I, just love it. I love it. I love it. And the fact that it's with shoes, because I love shoes. If you go up, you know, in my closet, I've got, yeah. I've got all these amazing shoes. Like Dol I love Dolce Vita shoes. Yeah. Uh, I've got that really pointy heel. heel. And when I'm wearing them, I can't wear them for that long. So basically your product solves that issue. Yeah, so um, just a little bit about the product and then we'll go back to the story. But the, our insoles are totally different. Um, so they were designed by a podiatrist and engineered by a rocket scientist, but they don't look like much. They don't take up much room in your shoe. And in essence, they rotate your heel bone up and back for an equal distribution of weight between the front of your foot and your heel and it stops your foot from slipping forward. So it doesn't cushion anything. It doesn't pad anything. It literally adjusts the pitch and position of your foot in the shoe um, to shift weight off your forefoot. So uh, it's just incredible. And we, I, I'm just so incredibly honored to have this opportunity to bring this product to market and to help women. Because I honestly believe that a pair of shoes can change your perspective on anything. Yes. It can make you feel more powerful. It can make you feel more courageous. It can make you feel more um, you, in essence. Um, and I, I just am so honored to be able to provide these insoles to help women, um, as I like to say, focus more on their dreams and less on their feet. So uh, I love um, this. I love this. Ah! You know, it's funny. My mom was texting me the other day a pair of uh, I don't know, maybe it was four four inch stiletto heels, and she's like, "Oh, I really wish I could wear these." So <laughs> I'll have to show she her can. this she show. Can. And it's funny because um, the women who have the most, um, I would say, emotional reaction to our insoles are women who tend to be a little bit older, and they thank us for now they can wear their closet of memories again. They don't have to donate the shoes that brought them so much joy for the past decades. And now they can wear them again because they're not in pain. And, um, you know, we all have those shoes that we buy because you, f you literally fall in love with them at the store yeah. and then you can't wear them and you can wear them like maybe down the hallway, not even down right. the stairs. The, the dinner shoes. We were having yes. a conversation, my mom and yes. I, the other day about the same shoes. And they're like, well, those are your dinner shoes. So you get dropped off at the door of the restaurant and, and walk you look to nice the table. To dinner. <laughs> 
So now we're making dinner shoes, functional shoes, because you can actually go out afterwards and stand at the bar and have a conversation without crying in pain. So, um, yeah, it's just been so much, so much fun. But um, throughout this journey, and one of the reasons why I wrote my book was I want to show women in particular who are middle-aged, middle-class, middle management, you know, Midwest moms who feel like they've just, their, their plot in life has been defined. It doesn't. If you want something more, just start. And, and literally mine was writing a blog post for an hour every week that eventually led to me pick, you know, picking up this phone call, which eventually me, led to me saying yes to an opportunity I knew nothing about. And you just keep you just keep taking one step every single day. And that's, that's kind of my, my mantra is, you know, it could be as simple as a Google search. It could be as simple as sending one email. It could be as simple as um, picking up the phone and asking a question. It doesn't need to be these big ginormous um, steps that I think a lot of women and particularly moms maybe feel like I can't go all in. I can't invest a hundred percent of my time, my energy, my money into an entrepreneurial journey. Cause I, that's not my life. And I was there. And um, I started this business with $7,500. My husband didn't even give me cash to do it. He said, you can open up a credit card with $7,500 limit nice. and that's it. And it was, a, and that was a lot of money for us to invest at that time. We had just moved. We were doing construction on a house. It was nuts, but um, I was so passionate about this. And I knew that I was meant for something more than just mm. going to work and putting my kids in daycare and just going yes. through the daily grind that um, I took a chance on me. And it was just through a series of small incremental steps that led to this amazing um, business that I'm so incredibly honored to have the privilege to bring to market. I, I love that. I love the fact too, is that, you know, you're talking about like little small steps to mm -hmm. get to your vision. Let's go back to before you picked up that phone uh, and, and was reaching out to the, the chairman. How did you overcome your, your fear? Because that is one of the biggest things that holds women back from really, you know, really living full out, you know, with building their business or going to that next level of their career. What was your thought process? So fear has played, it's really interesting. Fear has played a very powerful role in this journey. Um, I was afraid to admit, so even before I even started this blog, I was afraid to admit that I wanted something more because I was like, I had this good life. I don't deserve something more. I'm not worthy of something more. This is what, you know, this is my life. It's good. I shouldn't complain. I shouldn't feel bad. But that feeling of wanting something more woke me up literally like burned a hole inside of me and woke me up more nights than I care to remember. And so that fear um, quickly kind of transitioned to this burning fire inside of me that I needed to do something. And the fear of picking up the phone and calling the chairman, um, it, it transitioned into something, and I was scared. I was scared. What if he said no? What if he said, you know, what if, what if he was like, you're just a silly old blogger mom who has no, you know, you, why are you asking about my product? I mean, there were so many ways this could have gone. Um, I was just so tired. I had reached a breaking point and I was so tired of my um, current existence that I needed to do something more. Now, once Vivian Luce launched, I called it my hobby business because it was okay that it wasn't making money. And so I was afraid of putting my name on an email because I didn't want to be associated with a business that wasn't making money. I was afraid to try Facebook ads because what if I burnt through $10 a day and didn't make a sale? I was afraid to do, you name it. And so for a year and a half after Vivian Lou launched, I was in debt accumulating debt every single month. And as soon as I got over my fear of failure, which really I think comes down to women are afraid to fail. Like that's, yes. I think oh, people in general are afraid to fail. I now welcome failure. And that is the biggest fear piece for me. And I welcome it because there are so many lessons learned in failure that you would never learn if you didn't put yourself out there. And in my experience, the biggest opportunities and the biggest growth 
trajectories for both me personally and the business happened when I pushed myself outside of my comfort zone and not far, just, you know, just outside, just enough to make me really uneasy and things just took off. So, um, I would just encourage women to, to, uh, look at their fear and kind of identify what, why am I so afraid and what's the worst that can happen? Because when you reverse engineer fear and failure, it's not that bad. <laughs> You're like, okay, I embarrassed myself. Oops, let's move on to the next thing. You know, it's, it's not as bad as you think it's going to be. It, it's so true. I just think this is the most important conversation that we're having because fear is the number one thing that holds anyone ba uh, back from realizing their vision. And I like the fact that you're saying once you got over your fear and was, you, you were okay with it, you were able to accelerate your business. So exactly. the failure is necessary for you or everyone to go to the next level. I want everyone to kind of, you know, kind of tattoo that in your mind. Yes. <laughs> so you understand this. And one thing too, um, particularly early on in my journey is I realized I myself was holding me and the business back. I was so handcuffed by not feeling worthy, mm. not feeling smart enough, not feeling good enough. And I, I don't know how, but I knew that like this business isn't going to go anywhere if I'm stuck in these like self-limiting beliefs. And so it took a lot of work. Um, I partnered with an EFT practitioner, which is kind of woo woo. <laughs> if you know, um, uh, it's, it's yes. uh, EFT, yeah, it's the tapping mm -hmm. and it's totally, totally weird. Um, and the first couple of times I did it, I actually locked myself in my bathroom because I was like, God forbid my husband comes home <laughs> and seeing me do this. He'll think <laughs> I've lost it. But it really helped kind of clear this like stuck limiting belief in this ugly energy that had built up over years and years and years of just experiencing life, but me not feeling worthy enough of having this opportunity. And once I cleared that, it was just like, whoop, away we went. So, um, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it, the, it's being an entrepreneur and starting a journey like this is the biggest business lesson and the biggest lesson you like self-learning lesson. You learn so much yeah. about yourself through this process that it's, it's pretty amazing. It, it, it's so true. And, you know, I, I think the biggest thing, like you're saying, it's like changing your beliefs, however, you know, whatever modality that you're using. And I actually, um, you, you know, with, with the EFT, I mean, that really is dealing with the quote unquote energy in your body. If you realize yes. that everything is energy um, and your beliefs are energy, your beliefs hold energy uh, yep. through your subconscious mind, that this is a great way to transform that. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. And, yeah. and, and we've got to, yeah, we've got to work on those beliefs. So as you're creating this business, um, was there any point in that journey before you were really successful where you were like, can I, can I really do this? And, you know, you question yourself even when you started to get like a little bit momentum. Oh yeah. So, um, things, I always knew this business had potential. And I, I almost hate that word potential because there, you know, there's so much, that's such a loaded word, <laughs> but <laughs> I knew that this, that this product could change the lives of so many women. And so I was on a mission. I almost stepped outside of me and was like, I, it is my responsibility to get this product in front of women. Take me out of the equation and just connect those two. If I can just be the connector, that's it. So when the business started, um, I was still working full time. I knew the business had potential. And my husband knew that I was so gung ho on getting it off the ground that he allowed me to quit my corporate job one summer. And it was the summer of 2000, I think it was 15. And I quit. And he's like, you have three months to get the business uh, <laughs> functional and profitable. Otherwise you have to go back to corporate America. Wow. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I was like, yes, it is going to happen. Now in that three months, I met with a sales coach at a free seminar that was going on in Minnesota. She told me to raise my pricing and she raised my pricing. Within that three months, I identified that I myself was, was holding me back. So I started having sessions with an EFT practitioner. I, my brother-in-law actually introduced me to a woman in New York. I flew to New York to pitch the product to her store. Little did I know that the CEO of HSN, the Home Shopping Network, 
network was going to be there that night and she fell in love with the product. So while the business itself wasn't making money on a day-to-day -day basis, we t I took significant steps to set it up to launch. So my husband, after three months, was like, you have to go back to corporate America. And I did. So I had, I literally had to go back, put my resume back out there, find a new job and go back working nine to five every single day. And part of me, it killed me. But the day I started is the day I got a phone call from HSN saying that they were going to fast track my product through the wow. process. So wow. I was like, I'm not going to be here for long. <laughs> this is incredible. Okay, everyone, well, let's just take like a, like a pause here because what you said, you said so many things that are, are so important. So number one, you were talking about, you know, how things didn't work out exactly how you wanted it to. So you had to go back to your corporate job. Yep. And, and the moment that you kind of, kind of took a detour, that's when it happened. I, I truly believe there's like synchronicity in the universe. Absolutely. The, the, you know, the sooner you detach from the outcome, that's when it happens. <laughs> it's so true. And, and you know what they say about like holding a butterfly? Like if you have this dream and you're like holding it so, so tightly that mm -hmm. you're like crush it and it doesn't go anywhere. I feel like, and, and people say this all the time, but I have experienced it time and time again in my ex journey. Put a goal out there. Like say, I want this to be, I want to be in retail and you have no idea how that's going to happen. And you don't attach like a how or a timeline or a whatever to it. You just say, I want to be in retail and you just take incremental steps. Like if something comes up, you say yes and you entertain it and may not work out, may not, but you just kind of put it out there and let it marinate however it shows up. And then things start happening. And I don't know how, I can't explain it, but as soon as you detach from the outcome and the timeline and the exact way it's going to happen, it happens. I love it. Yeah. It, it, it's so true. It's so true. You know, another thing I want to talk about, because I work with a lot of uh, women entrepreneurs and the biggest thing that I find that will stop them if they are creating their big vision and they have a partner, their partner can put uh, you know a wrench into their their dreams and desires. So, uh, was your husband supportive of your dream? I know he kind of gave you a budget and a timeline. Was there any point where he was questioning you along your journey? So, um, Bill has played. My husband has played a f tremendous role in this, and I would say that it was because of him that I actually had the courage to go out and do this. But he is not involved in my business. Um, he stopped asking me questions early on because I would get upset or get have anxiety when he would ask me questions. It was almost like I was reporting to a boss or to oh. my dad or to, you know what I'm saying? And so we just stopped talking about it. And um, he thought I was at least covering my corporate card expenses every month. And I wasn't. And so not that that's very healthy to not share your financial situation with your husband, but I was in debt and he didn't know how far in debt I was. Um, and then I started climbing myself out of debt. And so um, even today, um, you know, he, he, all he asked was if I quit my corporate job to be able to cover my corporate salary. That's all he asked. Like if, if this makes you happy and you're home for the kids and you can get the kids off to school and help them with their homework and this is how you want to live, at least cover your corporate salary. So that was like the, the agreement that we had. Um, and then, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's continued to evolve, but I don't like Bill in my business, to be quite honest. I hear um, you. <laughs> yeah, but he's, I mean, even today, now that we are making money, and I have had, I've been fortunate enough to be able to give us bonuses outside of me covering my corporate salary. I don't want him to come to expect bonuses. And so we have these conversations about money, um, about, you know, do you raise your, your salary now? And so you just pay yourself more every month, you know, all of these sorts of conversations. And we operate still as if I were working corporate, a corporate job. Like if I have to travel, we make sure that our calendars align so that one of us is home with the kids and all that sort of stuff. And so um, I've been fortunate enough in that Bill has, prov he never questioned me and my ability to get it done. He questioned whether I could live up to, are you covering your corporate salary? And that was an agreement we had. And if I wasn't after three months, like I had explained before, I had to go back to corporate America and bring in the money into our household. So, um, 
we have a really unique relationship and, and um, I know not everyone has that ability to kind of, he kind of detaches from what's going on in the daily, the daily operations, which is so thankful because he and I could not run a business <laughs> together yeah. at all. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been interesting and it's, we've learned a lot about our relationship through this, through this venture as well. Um, but yeah, I'm just thankful he doesn't, ask me every day how it's going. <laughs> yeah, it, it can be challenging. Yeah. And that, I think that's where yeah, you have to get clear on your responsibilities, talk about money, um, yeah. talk about the vision moving forward. But I, I think that, I think that's the most important thing for women to kind of stand in their power. Like, wait a minute, this is my baby. This is my vision. Yes. Because a lot of women I find when they have kids, they give up so much of who they are and they don't go after what they want. And then they get to the end of their lives going, why did I not take a why did I? Myself? Yeah. One thing in the beginning, and I know this sounds kind of odd and totally not romantic, but we actually signed a contract be between the two of us before he would give me a, and I hate to say permission. Cause it, right. I mean, I made my own money, It would, but I don't, we have a relationship that we don't do anything without each other's like at least blessing. Like, Hey, I may not agree with it, but thanks for telling me. Yeah, go ahead and do that. Um, so before we even agreed on the credit card, um, we wrote down an agreement. Like it will, com the computer will stay in the basement. I will, it will not sacrifice family time. I will still exercise every day. I will still make dinner every day. It will, it will not be all consuming. So I think it was, com he was comfortable because he knew kind of the guardrails that we had agreed to before we embarked on this journey. So I think yeah. if you, if a woman can say, Hey, I'll still pick up the kids from daycare, or I'm still responsible for laundry, dinner, whatever the responsibilities are within the household and the framework of the relationship. Like, th I think that's where potentially partners get uncomfortable. It's like, Oh no, is our entire dynamic going to change if she starts doing this? And I think if you just put some sort of arrangement or agreement around that, there's less, anxiety on the partner side. Uh, I agree. I think that's a good point. And I don't actually think that's weird. I think if more couples <laughs> that are creating businesses separately have those guidelines, because I think a lot of men uh, become fearful when they see a woman that is empowered, especially financially. Um, historically, you know, it, it's just been this kind of uh, paradigm or belief that 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 women are playing a smaller game and, and then so when it starts changing men don't really know how to handle it, handle and it. <laughs> unconsciously so I think I think that kind of eased his mind to say okay now that we have all of the the rules for engagement I, I yes. think about that I don't yeah. think there's anything wrong with that I think that I think that and makes a lot of sense. And he's like silently my biggest cheerleader. Like he's a very healthy skeptic on everything that I do and continue to do to grow the company. He's a very healthy skeptic, but he's also like my biggest cheerleader, but he's silently like cheering, cheering for yes. me. And he, uh, like, I love my husband because he is not threatened at all by me potentially making or currently making more money than him. Like, he's like, go for it. This is awesome. You know, he's not threatened at all by that, which is awesome. But um, I do want to take a step back and talk about a little bit between like masculine energy around entrepreneurship and like feminine energy around entrepreneurship. Because when I started this business, there, um, you know, and I still look up to Sarah Blakely. Like, I think she is the, the founder of Spanx. Like, she yes. is just phenomenal. But she had the luxury of growing her business when she was younger, wasn't married, didn't have kids, all of those sorts of things. So like I look to her for inspiration and current inspiration because she is still running her business and has a family and all this kind of stuff. But um, when you look at other people like men as who have grown their business, even, even with families, they have the luxury of almost investing 100% of themselves into a business. And women, I don't, I don't know if they can, like particularly, even if they're married or just have a dog or whatever the case may be, or, or have friends, like they invest so much of their themselves personally in other areas that I don't think it's possible for a woman to 100% invest into a company emotionally. And I think that's okay. Like you look at Gary Vee and you look at Tony Robbins and you look at all these people and it's so like, kill it, smash it, grind it, go a hundred percent. You got to go all in. And literally I grew, my business is now a multi-million dollar company and I grew it by somersaulting and stumbling and, you know, tripping and, taking weeks off because my kids were sick. It doesn't, you don't have to go 
all, I, I feel like sometimes entrepreneur, entrepreneurial models are so hardcore. It doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to sacrifice yourself or your time or your life outside of a company to actually grow a healthy, thriving, profitable company. I love that. I, I love that explanation because I think a lot of times women look at those male figures and say, oh, I should be like that instead of finding your own formula that works for you, not one size fits all. You know, when it comes and, to and I think it's also important when you're starting out to define your metric of success because oftentimes yes. people are like a top line sales revenue number. That's great, but that doesn't mean it's profitable. Uh, profitable. Other people say, hey, I want to have this much money in the bank. That's great too. But my metric of success is peace and freedom. And that's it. And so I know I have had opportunities to take this company to the next level, to partner with people, to really blow it out of the water. Shark Tank has called twice and I turned them down. Um, wow. It's because it, all of those things would sacrifice my peace and freedom. And the reason yes. I started this was simply to cover my corporate salary and to be home for my children. That's it. I love it. And so if it's like my metric of success, like I said, is peace and freedom. And I don't do anything that sacrifices that. Even if that means the company would grow more, I would have a bigger bank account. Um, it's just not worth it. I, I love that. So you're basically defining success on your own terms. Yes. Yeah. That, that is so powerful. I really want women to, to hear about this. Now, I also want to ask you a question about money because I think women kind of shy away from this or like, oh my gosh, money, oh, I, I, I'm bad for wanting a lot of money. Did you ever visualize this business as it was taking off that it would be a multi-million dollar company? No, and in fact, I would have choked trying to get that out. <laughs> Literally, probably, probably two and a half years ago, I would have choked trying to say that. When I started off and the business was humming along, I was making $1,500 a month. So not enough to cover my lost corporate salary. Um, I then met with a sales coach who really flipped the script as it relates to money because I always felt selfish for wanting money. And she's like, all money is, is energy. And it flows from one person to the other. And you, the more you have, the more you can give, the more you can use to for greater good. And it's not always donating to charities and that kind of stuff, but if it's money, to, you know, my husband wants to retire and manage property. So if we invest in a new property, my husband is a phenomenal property manager and takes care of the tenants that live in these buildings. So the money that may, may have come from my business into his pro, like our properties, but he's managing it. He's giving the people who live there a much better life because he is a much better property manager than the person who would have owned that property previously. So it, it's just all of this, it's, it's energy. And so yes. through those conversations, I've become more um, accepting of saying that I want money. Um, and then she had asked me to project out a half million dollar year, like literally sit down and where is that money going to go? Or where's that money going to come from? And once you get that, where is that money going to go? Because she always says money loves a plan. You can't attract and accept money if you don't know where it's going to go. So you need to create this path for money to flow in and out. And literally when I was sitting down with her, I was probably $80,000 in debt. I was making $1,500 a month. I was like, there is no way I can project out a, 15, a half million dollar year. And sure enough, you put it to paper. I closed that year and I met with her, I want to say maybe in April. I closed that year with $650,000 in sales. Nice. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I, my journey is, <laughs> I like to like attribute it and thank it to like the universe has played a huge role in like providing opportunities. And I know that sounds so woo woo, but there is something about stating a goal, saying yes. a goal, writing it down, and then taking teeny tiny steps. Even if you have no idea where that's going to end up, it just somehow has a way of working itself out. I love that. I love that. Let's go back to you because you're talking about the, you know, owning your value and worth uh, and raising your prices. So I'm curious, yes. what was your price point before? Yes. So um, when I first launched Vivian Liu, it was two for 1995. 
okay. two pairs of insoles for 1995. And that summer that I took off and I went to the sales camp is when I met my sales coach, Ursula Menchez, who was phenomenal. She looked me straight in the eye and she's like, you're not charging enough. And I was like, wait, what? Like, I literally had just introduced myself. And she's like, what's your product? What's your price point? She's like, you need to double your price. I was like, you don't even know me. You've not even tried my product. How dare you say this? Like, I was so flabbergasted. And so as soon as I like caught my breath, I was like, okay, when do I do that? And she was like, tomorrow. I was like, what? <laughs> literally sent an email to all of my customers on my customer list and said, I'm raising my price. You can buy them at this price for the next three months. But after that, it's going to be double the price. I got two hate mails out of like a list of 2,500 women. I mean, it was nuts. It was nuts. And then um, I was through serendipitous uh, events. I met uh, Adam Glassman, who was the creative director of O Magazine. And they called and they're like, what's your price point? And by then I was like, I don't want to sell it for 1995 anymore. It needs to be because then 1995 was at the same price point as a Dr. Scholl's and a foot pedals and all of these other insoles. And our insole is so scientifically superior to those that I needed women to stop and think and be like, why, why is she charging $29 for an insole? Like I had already come to this conclusion. And so when they called and said, what's your price point? I was like, $29 here we go. And they put it in print. And the day the magazine came out, I raised the price on the website and we haven't looked back. Um, people love our products. It's absolutely worth $29 because it's a permanent placement insole. It lasts the lifetime of your shoe forever changes the way you wear high heels. I mean, there are so many reasons why the it's $29 is worth it for the, for the pair of the insoles. Now, if you buy it in bundles, you get much, we offer discounts and bundle discounts and all that kind of stuff. But we buy one pair, it's $29. And I am so comfortable saying that because this product is absolutely worth $29 and more because it will, like I say, forever change the way you wear your shoes. And to me, shoes mean everything. <laughs> I love that. Oh my gosh. Uh, this interview is so inspiring. I mean, just talking about raising your value. And as soon as you did, you got a coach and a mentor, which to me, everyone should have a coach and mentor. That's when your business took off, took off. right? It, it took off. So I want, I want women to um, get a mentor. If you're stuck in your business, you, you, you got to get help. You, you can't do it alone. You know, you, you can't be your own doctor performing heart surgery, right? If right. You, <laughs> you, yeah. you got to get that help. And I, I, also another thing, Abby, I wanted to point out is that you, once it became not about you and it was a vision of helping other women, I think that's an important thing to note in this conversation. So it, it allowed you to get past your bills and, you know, put a value on other people. I think that's so beautiful. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm just, like I said, I am so grateful and, and incredibly blessed to be able to, to do this. And, and really, besides running my own business, I'm just so thankful to help women wear the shoes they love without pain. I mean, it's just, like I said, I think shoes mean, you know, can change your perspective on anything. It's just so fun to be able to talk about shoes and helping women wear shoes yes. every day. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, and I want to encourage all the women out there to, of course, take these words of wisdom, uh, but to check out, um, check out your site, wherever you're listening or watching this, um, you can go in the show notes, but you can go over to vivianlu.com. Uh, v i v i a n l o u dot com and and change your life by wearing those. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> your and if people are interested, I know this is is I I don't want to self promote here, but if people are interested in reading more about my journey, I did I did write my memoir and it is available on Amazon. It's called Strap on a Pair. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh, so clever. No promote promote. This this is all about you. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'll go ahead and I'll put that in the show notes as well. Uh, Abby, thank yes. you so much for sharing your fearless journey and, and how you are uh, breaking the rules for women today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This has been so much fun. My pleasure. My pleasure. Until next time, this is Heather Pickin. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. So if you like what you hear on this podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe. 
interested in becoming a sponsor or learning more about leadership for women's performance using neuroscience or business coaching, contact support at heatherpicken.com. And don't forget to grab my latest book, The La Dolce Vita Formula, by going to fearlessandfabulousbook.com. That's fearlessandfabulousbook.com.